Right. We're all going through a period of great crisis and the world is reeling under the attack of COVID-19 pandemic. Its repercussions are seen the world over and we are forced to shift our patterns of life, learning and teaching. And that explains why we, why we have shifted from seminars to webinar. And in this webinar, through this webinar, we are trying to address the changes that will be brought in the post-pandemic era in language, literature and culture. Now let's begin the first session of this two-day international webinar and I invite Dr. A.C. Srihari, Assistant Professor of our department, to deliver the welcome address. Hearty welcome to you, sir, Dr. Ajayagumar P.P. Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Kerala. Dr. Ajagumar has, to his credit, a book titled Interventions, Readings in Literature and Culture. And he is currently the editor of the journal Literature, an Indian response to literature, a literary journal published from Trivandrum. The founder editor being Dr. P. K. Rajan, former Vice Chancellor of Kanur University. Dr. Ajay Kumar has his PhD in postcolonial dialectics. In novels. Yes, they have started. He visited University of Western Ontario, Canada, University of Toronto, etc., as part of faculty enrichment program offered by Shastri Indo Canadian Institute to conduct a study on culture literature interface, multiculturalism, and Canadian short fiction. Also, to his credit, he has done a UGC research project on ethnobiographies, representation of the other in Dalit autobiographies. He has engaged in teaching at various government colleges under collegiate education departments, like Krishnamanan Memorial Government Women's College, Kano. And Government College Alayratatu Kasavod. And he has been working as the director of the Institute of Distance Education, University of Kerala, before he assumed this post of the Pro Vice Chancellor. Dr. Ajay Kumar is a gifted artist, and he has had a painting exhibition recently in Kanur, his hometown. He writes in Malayalam as well. And this is his latest article on film. And here is a Facebook post by him a week back on Pailur College English Department, his alma mater. And being an acclaimed alumnus of our department, I welcome you, sir, to this international webinar. Then I welcome Dr. Premachandran Kirod, principal of our college, and also Dr. Sandosh Viyam, coordinator, IQAC Pioneer College. And also Mr. A. Nishant, member of Syndicate, Kanur University. And all the members of the Department of English. And the participants and other dignitaries. Welcome once again, all of you. Thank you, sir. 
Now I invite Dr. Premachandran Kirot, head of the department and principal of our college, to deliver the presidential address. Respected Chief Guest, Dr. P. P. Ajay Kumar, Pro Vice Chancellor of Kerala University, also the prestigious alumnus of the Department of English. See A. Nishant, member Kanu University Syndicate, Dr. V. M. Santosh, Dr. A. C. Srihari, Mrs. Ratna Prapa, Ms. Amrita Vaiduri, my dear colleagues, all the participants of this webinar, a warm good morning. Once again, we went back to the dark age. The darkness and the panic created by COVID-19 is incomparable. We were literally quarantined. We don't know what may happen tomorrow. But at the same time, COVID-19 gave us immense opportunities. People all over the world started searching for an alternative. Our government is doing all possible measures to mitigate the damages caused by this pandemic. When the lockdown began in the last week of March, we were literally kept away from our academic activities. A type of lethargy spread all over. But we soon acclimatized with the new situation, like using sanitars and using masks. We started attending webinars also. Interesting and important for me to participate in this international webinar. And uh, as I remember, is blessed with very, very uh, great teachers and talented students. And uh, each class was a, an enriching experience for our students <coughs> at that time. But even then, uh, when I uh, saw the aerial view of the college at present, I, I found that during the time, the college was very small and uh, infrastructure facilities were very few. But now it has improved a lot. A lot of new buildings and new facilities have come up. That certainly shows the kind of development the college had during these past 30 years. And uh, I remember most of the teachers, So I, uh, since this is not a, an occasion for me to speak at length about the college, I limit my comments to this. And uh, at first, I would like to announce the uh, <coughs> inauguration of this particular seminar, Post-Pandemic Language, Literature and Cultures, a Prospective View. I declare that the seminar is open. Sir, our everyday life, our education, everything associated with human beings. So devoid of confidence and devoid of pride and, and devoid of the megalomaniac pretensions human beings will have to reconstruct their image once again in you. And uh, so looking at this epidemic from such a point of view, uh, we can see that it is not just our human body that is affected by this pandemic, but it is our culture, our economy, our everyday life, our educational practices, and uh, our business, Everything is affected by this pandemic. And I am remembered of Shelley who wrote the uh, West Ode to the West Wind, where he uh, uh, shows that the West Wind becomes a kind of a revolutionary force which sweeps and removes and transforms everything in this world. But this small COVID or coronavirus again becomes. A, a, a different kind of an agent which demystifies everything. It kills, it destroys, at the same time also demystifies several of our 
false pretensions and false concepts and illusory beliefs etc now for example i can cite some of the examples that we see in our day to day experience now because uh one thing that we find is that some of our uh, ceremonial celebrations have lost the aura uh for example take the case of marriage the marriage ceremonies were conducted in a very huge manner spending lakhs and crores of rupees were thousands of people assembled together and what happens now now we find that only 10 or 15 maximum 20 people are allowed to assemble for a marriage it has become very simple i think this is the way it should have been in the past also we have learned that we can uh, conduct such uh, uh, ceremonies in a very simple fashion so corona or covid 19 taught us many lessons this is one and another is the kind of mad drive towards the the temples and the mosques and the, the religious centers now we have learned to pray at home and we may be remembered of uh, the literature students may be remembered of tagore speaking about this in his famous poem gitanjali where he says that he asks a question whom does the worship in this lonely dark corner of a temple with doors all shut just open thine eyes and see thy god is not before thee and he continues he says he is there where the tiller is stilling the hard ground and where the pot maker is breaking stones so what tagore said is very much relevant today because now people have learned to worship from home they have realized to a certain extent that the divinity resides in themselves not in a dark chamber so we find that covid nineteen has started creating transformations in our life it can as a great leveler in the sense that it has no differences differences of color differences of social status caste or creed or religion or region or race or country etc it is a leveler it affects everybody equally and everybody is afraid of this so in that sense i am saying that covid has uh, actually uh, influenced our understanding of this world it has transformed our own perceptions about the and it is going to transform um, our 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 world itself in the near future so destabilized by this covid we find that some of our recent concepts of the world and how the world should function like globalization has also been affected very much we have been uh, visualizing a global village a romantic concept of the world as one a united world where everybody exchanges and uh, and interacts very smoothly and uh, supports each other we have been given such a perception about globalization but now we find that the the whole aura behind globalization has been destroyed it has been uh, <clears throat> we find that it has been lost because nations are now concerned about their own plight their their own safety we have listened to trump and uh, uh, boris johnson and many other leaders uh, and the change in their attitude after the covid 19 so we find that uh, globalization as a concept has been heavily affected by this uh, covid 19 and uh, the fanciful concepts of transnationalism is also very much damaged 
And recently, the famous philosopher Sisek commented that uh, this uh, epidemic will damage capitalism in a, in a very, very dangerous manner because capitalism has been uh, considered to be a, a development model which is ideal for the whole world after the failure of the communist uh, governments and, and Soviet Union and uh, the Eastern Europe. And we find that capitalism is hailed as the development model and that development model has been heavily affected by the spread of COVID-19. And moreover, the very idea of capitalist development has also been affected by this. So we find that COVID-19 has left the world uh, uh, in, a, in a very different uh, position from what it was before. We have seen the plight of the migrant laborers of India who have been uh, escaping from the cities to their villages. So that scene, uh, the people, migrant laborers, uh, walking or moving from cities to their own villages for safety itself is, is symbolic of the failure of the capitalist mode of development. So capitalism may survive in a different fashion, but not in the same fashion. There will be a radical change in the way it functions in future. And that is what uh, Sisek observes. And another uh, thing that has been affected by COVID-19 is the so-called elitism because the elitist mentality is that uh, nothing will be affected. They will not be affected by anything because they are rich and they have high social status etc. But now it has been proved that nobody is free from COVID. Anybody and everybody can uh, come under the threat of COVID. So elitism is also under threat. So we find that COVID-19 has transformed the world. And there are people who think that this is only a dress rehearsal, a dress rehearsal for a deeper crisis that is going to happen in the near future. Because we know that these are all the, the, or the results of uh, the global warming, the changes in the weather conditions, the heavy rains, and the spread of viruses, all are interrelated. So we will have to expect more such epidemics and calamities to come in future. So that is a very bleak kind of picture that they give. But one thing is sure that life will not be the same and we cannot go back to the normal. Normal in the sense that if we consider the pre-COVID period, the pre-COVID life as normal, we won't be able to go back to that normalcy in future. Because we will be having, we will be living in a totally different world after COVID. In many respects, it will be different. So education is also not exempted from this. Education will also be different in the post-COVID period. And now there are lots of discussion on uh, the kind of education and uh, the dissemination of education in the post-COVID period. Many people advocate online education and uh, uh, use of technology in education certainly is going to be a, a, going to play a key role uh, in the education system in the post-COVID scenario. We know that Google Classrooms, video lessons, web-based learning will have uh, a very important role in the post-COVID scenario. So I don't know whether we have imagined a post-COVID classroom. Even the classroom will be different. Uh, it won't be the same kind of classroom where the teacher uh, teaches with chalk and the blackboard. So the chalk and board method is going to change immediately. Uh, we will see that the classroom will be a kind of a, a studio, 
a recording studio or a studio where there will be facilities for recording facilities for projection facilities for online streaming that is going to be the nature of a classroom in the post covid scenario even even if or even when we escape or we, we come out of this uh, the threat of covid and we find that there are educationists who believe that the smartphone will be the future classroom a smartphone will be the future classroom and uh, high speed internet is certainly a must and a uh, lot of educationists believe that this kind of an education system if it emerges in future will have its own uh, defects because a lot of students a lot of people especially in the developing countries do not have access to education access to mobile phones smartphones and internet even now and so what happens is that such students will be kept out of this uh, kind of an education they will not be able to join the classrooms if it is uh, then yeah, through this uh, uh, google meet or some uh, some such uh, method so that is certainly a threat but at the same time it is uh, also important that uh, the pandemic will uh, affect the uh, the education system Uh, in such a way that the 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 kind of uh, high tech industry is going to intervene and involve themselves heavily in the higher education system there is going to be a lot of collaborations between universities and uh, high tech industries or uh, uh, such uh, business institutions like google and uh, they will be trying to collaborate with important universities and uh, develop platforms for uh, higher education dissemination of education so uh, i think re, uh, in future we may find harvard plus google so the names of the universities are going to be changed altered in future so we find that education is not just certification it is not just getting a certificate it is not just uh, learning something through online teaching etc uh, it is uh, something uh, re- it is also related to the campus education at the campus the experience of the campus learning through uh, uh, contact with uh, other students learning through experience is also very important and the future students are going to lose such kind of experiences that is certainly a threat but i think uh, technology can uh, develop uh, practices through which uh, they will be able to give the experience of the campus through uh, the distance uh, learning through the distance so called distance learning through or online teaching so Uh, it is important that we have to devise we have to find out we have to develop such methods which can be termed as hybrid methods of education so i i feel that and many other educationists think that online teaching is certainly a, 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 an important option for our education system in future but at the same time it is not the only option we cannot discard face to face teaching face to face teaching is also one of the uh, important ingredients of education so a hybrid variety of teaching which involves online teaching and offline face to face teaching uh, will certainly be a proper solution or a proper methodology for teaching in the post covid scenario and at the same time universities should venture into such activities immediately because we know that if our universities the public universities and the public education system do not venture into such activities if we turn our 
back to such uh, noble developments, what will happen is that the so-called high-tech universities or the private universities which have high-tech facilities will certainly be enrolling thousands and lakhs of students using the, the, the high-tech facilities that they have and that will certainly lead to uh, the destruction of or closing down of the traditional universities or the, uh, the so-called brick and mortar universities. The brick and mortar universities where only face-to-face -face classes are conducted. So I think it is extremely important that we should understand the, the relevance and the immediacy of switching over to online teaching along with face-to-face -face teaching. And uh, we have to develop intermedia classrooms. Intermedia classrooms where we have the face-to-face -face teaching along with the use of other media, different types of media. And uh, that will certainly uh, lead us to a culture of hybrid education which is certainly a key term uh, which is going to be popularized in the near future. So we find that our governments, our universities should invest on the digital content development, developing digital facilities. There is a, a term that is now developing which is known as digital economy. Digital economy and this digital economy Development of this digital economy is also very important. And uh, because only through uh, providing internet at every nook and corner of our country, of our state, only by giving access to even ordinary people to smartphones, only through such cross, uh, programs, we will be able to uh, implement this kind of education successfully. We now know that everything is online, even uh, getting ordinary certificates, that is also online. But even now the facilities, the digital economy has not developed much. The digital infrastructure is still not up to the mark. So we have to develop it. That will be an immediate task before uh, the universities and the, the governments and the local bodies. And uh, as David Harvey uh, has commented, unconditional pro-technology approach is needed in this, uh, in this situation. There are uh, critics who believe, who, who point out several objections to the development of, or uh, to the introduction of online teaching. Those objections are relevant to a great extent, but at the same time, uh, our attitude should be pro-technology. We cannot turn our face towards technology. We cannot, uh, sorry, not, we cannot turn our back towards technology. We cannot uh, keep away from using technology. Unconditional pro-technology approach uh, is the only option that we have. And even now, there are a lot of uh, platforms, online platforms like Coursera, Udemy, which offers online courses. I think we will also have to develop a lot of such uh, platforms and a lot of us such programs for the benefit of our students. And so I think one of the options that we will have today will be this pro-technology approach. And uh, that will, and only that will help us in sustaining our education system and in keeping the resilience of our educational system, especially the uh, public education system that we are proud of, that we have been preserving for centuries. And uh, if we have to continue with this kind of uh, public education system, we have to be, we have to develop a pro-technology approach, an unconditional pro-technology approach and face the challenges very boldly, uh, very realistically providing all kinds of facilities for all people, providing access to everybody for the 
uh, internet and the smartphones and and developing contributing uh, profusely to digital content development i think this is uh, going to be a very important task though a difficult task for all educationists in future so to conclude i would say that uh, covid has affected every aspect of life every uh, area of life every uh, that means region of the world and our world is going to be a totally different world in the post covid era whether we like it or not and uh, so thank you once again for listening to me and for inviting me to this uh, seminar for inaugurating the seminar so i i i wish all success to this novel venture by the college thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you for the informative talk on education during the lockdown period and the problems and prospects of the post covid education system you have also gone deep into the impacts of this deadly virus on human life and how it has demystified everything you have also shown us how the pandemic has blown the blown up the aura of globalization capitalism and elitism thank you very much sir and now the session is open for discussion i request the participants to post your questions in the chat box we will have a very brief question and answer session yes participants can please post your questions in the chat box so we have a question from shashi zorba who you think that the capital is destroy after this pandemic period it's going to be more powerful uh, actually i didn't uh, hear the question do you think that the capitalism is going to be destroyed after this pandemic period or is it going to be more powerful okay uh, i think that I, uh, i think what i said is clear i think that capitalism is going to be affected by this uh, pandemic uh, we don't know whether it is going to be destroyed but it is heavily affected by this pandemic so it may do, uh, find out new devices to survive so one thing is sure that the ca capitalism the capitalist uh, system will not be the same as before as it was in the pre covid era because even now we have seen that donald trump has started controlling the private companies uh, we know that in america the private companies uh, they are not under the government control but now the government is forced to control the private companies because that is the kind of situation that they are in so i think some such uh, strategies will be developed by capitalism for survival in the near future we don't know whether it will be destroyed or not but it is going to be altered it is it will it will certainly be a different kind of capitalism in the post covid era okay so we have a question from shivnath kumar so do you think that online teaching can replace talk and talk teaching so uh, it it is the the question uh, so is uh, i think it has been answered by me in the presentation yes. itself talk yes. and talk method cannot be replaced by online teaching but online teaching is a strategy that we can adopt in the present situation and in future as well and it has to be coupled with talk and talk method there there can be a hybrid kind of method for teaching which involves both online teaching and chalk and talk method but we don't know whether 
the technology can develop and devise strategies to replace talk and talk with online teaching so such uh, 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 possibilities also that we cannot keep away such possibilities so, yes. uh, so oh, okay uh, so so there are similar questions uh, which deal with the general digital divide that is prevalent in india so i will read out a question from sarjan nalpadi with our limited online resources both soft and hard resources how is education in rural india going to be affected so it's yes, that is a very important the, yes digital divide yes yeah. uh, it is uh, the digital divide is certainly a very important issue that we have to address immediately and that is i think kerala government has started a, a kind of program for providing internet at every part of kerala i think it is known as knet and that is very important uh, providing electricity similar to providing electricity providing internet at every nook and corner of the country is extremely important and giving access to uh, smartphones uh, uh, such gadgets electronic gadgets is also extremely important for us to continue in the near future and that is going to be one issue uh that will be really challenging for the governments for the administrators in the near future otherwise there will be a, a really a great digital divide yes so we have a similar question from benny matthew and uh, shanif i think hope uh, i hope uh, sir has answered your questions now we are moving on to an, uh, another question from uh, neetu baby so do you think this pandemic will be responsible for privatization of education with technology as a tool for it yes, certainly i think one uh, possibility is that uh, the big universities or the university private universities uh, which has a very strong capital support is going to collaborate with big industries like google or uh, facebook or some such uh, uh, players big players in the technology and they are going to develop strategies for online education in a big way so naturally a lot of students are going to join such programs in the near future and when a lot of students about 60% of students join such programs which is conducted by such big uh, private universities that will indirectly affect the public universities the ordinary uh, brick and mortar universities uh, where online facilities are not there so the number of students who join such universities universities will certainly be reduced so that will create a kind of situation where some of such universities will have to be closed to down so this is the kind of danger that we have before us that is why i said we cannot be uh, we cannot turn our back to technology technology based learning we have to adopt it fully unconditionally and okay now we have a comment from beena noo uh, it is a comment sir post covid effects may not last for long history proves it post world wars post plague time we overcame the effects within a few years so that's a comment and oh, okay, okay. That, that, let it be like that yes let it be like that <laughs> we we can hope for the best yes now we have a question from susanna korea what will be the role and responsibility of internet service providers in view of the potential digitization of education what will they have to optimize so what happens uh, what is going to happen in future is that uh technology and education will have a very very strong collaboration technology is very going to play a very important role in education our teachers have to learn the techniques of uh, teaching using technology in future that is going to be a very important uh, aspect of our teaching so naturally internet providers and uh, the, the companies and private agencies and uh, public institutions that deal with technological uh, developments 
and protection of such uh, gadgets as well as uh, software will certainly be playing a very important role in the dissemination of education and uh, there is no doubt about that even now i think they have been uh, providing because uh, something like byju sap is certainly a very good example of how technology influences our learn teaching and learn yes now we have a question from vivek vs so how much of a factor is space going to be in online education how much of a factor is space going to be in online education it's a question of what space. space yes space in online education mm -hmm. uh what does she mean by space here maybe this, uh is it a geographical space <laughs> i don't know uh mm -hmm. i i ask you to clarify can you please clarify your question and post it once again in the chat box vivek vs Now we are, we are moving on to our next question. Yes, okay, okay. Ruthik Shankar. Uh, it's a question from Ruthik Shankar, sir. No, will this crisis? She has, clarified, she has clarified that it is classroom space. Okay. okay. Certainly, I think uh, we cannot give away. We cannot leave the classroom space uh, completely, because it is in the classroom that we uh, we learn along with our friends, along with others, along with other. Uh, students so the the influence of our classmates also play a very important role in shaping our personality in fashioning our understanding of the world so in the online platform we are going to lose that part of education so that is certainly a very very important thing so we cannot give away the classroom as such completely or the campus as such completely the classroom and the campus certainly have a lot of things to contribute in the in developing the personality in uh, in making learning an experience in shaping uh, the perspective of the student etc so i think classroom space and the campus space will continue to play an important role but at the same time added to that there will be an online space which will contribute which will add to the other experience of learning so we don't have to keep away the classroom as such okay so we have a lot more of questions but due to time constraints uh, i'll uh, read out the last question for the session we have a question from uh, rithvik shankar so will this crisis bring with it a new kind of elitism new kind of elitism uh, okay that, that is true uh, a new if an old kind of elitism vanishes a new kind of elitism is going to develop what i referred to the private universities the the collaboration between very uh, technological giants and uh, uh, private universities is going to happen that will certainly or that may certainly lead to another kind of elitism but we have to challenge or we have to uh that i think uh, do our best to challenge this by adopting technology and making and making it available to all the people to to the public to the the uh, and uh, providing internet and such facilities at every nook and corner of the society that is that is our tradition we have uh, our society developed through education everybody was given free education and that is the key for the development of kerala society and that is what i believe so education is the key so providing facilities for education to all is certainly going to be a, a kind of challenge before us so can we uh, have one more question there is one more interesting power. question from nivi rk so how far can we use the marxian tools of analysis in understanding this covid pandemic can we unite the whole marxists of the world to escape from this global threat with the support of have nots or downtrodden people so that certainly marxian tools means i think marx ideas are useful in in dealing with all activities of life it is many people think that it is a political philosophy it is merely a political philosophy 
it is not it is a kind of a an analytical tool which will help us to face all kinds of challenges all kinds of problems in our day to day life because we will be able to see what is real what is facts it is mavo who said we should learn truth from facts but most often what happens is that we try to indulge ourselves in seeing the illusory halo around everything not the reality that is hidden there so marxism teaches us to see the reality the the the, the hidden truth that is behind everything and i think uh, now in kerala we find that if you if you uh, cite an example which is slightly controversial because as you find that in one year before the, there was a huge issue connected with a, a temple entry in kerala and uh, during that time everybody was speaking about how important our faith and what, how important it is uh, for us to protect our faith etc etc but now in the in the covid situation what is happening in the society nobody is concerned about faith or any such thing everybody is concerned about their own life so we find that uh, if we analyze the situation from a marxist point of view we find that the people are uh, ready to see reality when their life is at stake they are not concerned about anything um when their life is at stake i think uh, we have to develop such scientific approach marxism is considered to be a scientific philosophy we have to develop such scientific approach towards everything in our life you know in everything that happens in our day to day life if we develop such approach i think we will be able to uh, tackle not only covid but all our all issues in a more realistic and a more fruitful in a more productive fashion yes thank you so much sir thank you so much for answering our questions we have a lot more questions but due to the busy schedule and all we are winding up the session thank you so much for sparing your time despite busy schedule with that thank we have you. come to the end of the first thank session you. i invite uh, ms ratna prabha associate professor of department of english pioneer college to deliver the word of thanks uh good morning one and all it's great pleasure to participate in this international webinar which is indeed a milestone for the department of english pioneer college instead of complacently sitting at home we are able to involve ourselves in great academic pursuits through these webinars in furthering our love for english literature as proved by the immense response for this webinar uh i like to convey my heartfelt thanks to the chief guest of the day dr ajay kumar pp pro vice chancellor of kerala university um uh, his talk was really uh what you call enlightening and he was able to give us a very realistic picture of the covid scenario and the post covid we cannot call it post covid because we are still um in uh, in the midst of it um kerala was very careful in the beginning but now we have a lot of patience so we have to be absolutely careful and uh, sir really told us um about the uh, grievous situation and the relevance of digital teaching in this area and so we all of us are able to realize the importance of digital learning and uh, the use of technology in all our modern endeavors uh, future endeavors uh in um university learning and school learning uh, etc so we uh, we have to change our um, overview itself uh so i thank you so very much uh, for your enlightening lecture so in a very simple manner you were able to uh, highlight all the problems of the present scenario and you also gave us remedies for um uh, solutions you know how to uh, approach uh the post pandemic scenario next i like to thank the principal in charge final college who is also the head of the department of english 
now he is very encouraging um, uh, to all the departments of, of conducting webinars now i like to uh, thank dr vm santosh of iqac um, so uh, he did not uh, leave any stone unturned to make this webinar a success i also like to uh, thank professor a nishant um, dr srihari for welcoming the program the participants my colleagues and uh, um, the young uh, um, um, amrita vaiduri who has been comparing and doing a very good work and also all the enthusiastic participants uh, in the webinar i like to thank uh, sohar university and also uh, kerala state higher education council um, so thank you very much uh, thank you everybody for the participation Uh, we are having a session on covid-19 and student engagement in virtual classroom and this is truly an international session we have resource persons of uh, different nationalities taking part here and actually this is the session that will be handled by our collaborator academic collaborator in this seminar the faculty of language studies uh, sohar university sultanate of oman and i am really a grateful to dr roy p wittel who has been instrumental in uh, making this academy collaboration a reality and this is how we are going to proceed with the session dr roy uh, will initiate the discussion and he will be talking about covid 19 elt meeting the challenge and he will speak for some 15 to 20 minutes uh, he will be followed by dr christine d d leon uh, who will be speaking from the from the same place uh, they are uh, in the same office now and uh, the third part of this session will be handled that will be on uh, online assignments and that will be handled by dr junifer abatayo who is currently in philippines he is joining us from philippines so coming to dr roy the first presenter dr roy p wittel uh, that is how he is known in the academic circle but we would like to uh, address him by the full name roy pushpa vilasam wittel because that was a fascinating name when we were in college he was uh, my senior and sri hari's classmate and he is an assistant professor of applied linguistics at sohar university at present uh, his academic credentials include a phd in uh, applied socio linguistics then of course he has an ma in english literature and a bed in english and he has to his credit the cambridge celta certificate a pgct and he is the ielts train the trainer certificate holder from the british council uh, he has authored a book entitled changing paradigms of english language teaching and the department of english pioneer college uh, uh, is very proud that we were able to release that book uh, last time when he was uh, in india last year i mean and he has also uh, contributed several book chapters and published in scopus index journals and uh, he has presented papers in uh, many international seminars also so i don't want to uh, continue with the formality any longer straight away uh, i request uh, dr roy p wittel to speak on the topic covid 19 post uh, covid 19 elt meeting the challenge over to you dr roy your mic your mic your mic your okay so let's proceed <laughs> yeah thank you sandosh uh, for your uh, kind introduction uh, in fact i am elated a little uh, uh, what to say your words have taken me back to the campus <laughs> i feel quite young now like i was there in the 80s 80s means uh, in the last in the second part of the 80s let people not think that i am too old so thank you very much once again for your kind uh, introduction uh, before i start my talk uh, on behalf of all of us here at the faculty of language studies sohar university uh, let me extend a warm welcome it's quite warm here in oman so i think warm welcome must be the most appropriate way to welcome you all uh, to this session uh, jointly organized by uh, pioneer college and uh, kerala research council 
and the Faculty of Language Studies, uh, Sohar University. Uh, I think uh, someone who spoke before me, I'm sorry I forgot the name, has rightly mentioned that we are not talking about uh, the post-COVID scenario now. Uh, actually, our focus is more on uh, not the post scenario, but the while uh, scenario, that is the present uh, scenario, the COVID-19 scenario, uh, and uh, student engagement uh, in English language classrooms. Uh, but there is nothing wrong uh, in assuming that some of the elements of uh, the present scenario will continue to remain on stage even after uh, the post-COVID scenario unmasks uh, itself, to use a, a COVID uh, term. So we hope it will unmask very soon, that's our hope. But some of the elements of, uh, like Dr. Ajay Kumar has rightly mentioned, we can, we can rightly assume that there is going to be uh, more incorporation of flipped learning, blended learning, or there is going to be more incorporation of technology uh, in teaching. Because certain things are like that. Once you trigger it, once you initiate them, it becomes very difficult to stop. And I, and I think we have initiated one such move now that is a greater incorporation of technology uh, into teaching. I believe that all of you will agree with me uh, if I say that we are uh, right now in a period of uh, transition as far as the mode of teaching or learning is concerned. Uh, to go back to our literature uh, classrooms, we all intuitively feel that something is slouching towards Bethlehem to be born at last. But as Eliot puts it in his generation, we still have our one hand on the door. And I think it is quite typical of any period of transition. Because on one side, we have our expectations about a new era that is about to be born. Of course, we can have our own expectations. Uh, for me personally, uh, my expectations grew because Dr. Ajay Gumar was mentioning that capitalism might collapse. <laughs> or at least uh, capitalism uh, might not continue in the same form as it is now. So we have our expectations about certain positive things, if I can put it that way, uh, about the post-corona uh, uh, scenario. At the same time, we also have our fears, our anxieties uh, about the post-COVID uh, scenario. And I think these anxieties and these worries need to be addressed. And webinars like these are actually attempts uh, to address those fears and anxieties. Now, if we look at uh, the present scenario, the questions about, let us say, the absence of the teacher in the classroom and also the absence of the student community in the classroom. The pre-corona classroom scenario, if I can put it that way, or the traditional concept of teaching is based on a very strong premise, which I personally believe in. And the premise is that the physical presence of the teacher and the physical presence of the student community in the classroom, these two things are important if the learners are to receive uh, again, to use COVID terms, the vitamins and the nutrients necessary to make them not immune uh, to language acquisition and language learning. And I think these are the two things that we are going to miss or we are missing uh, in the current or in the present scenario. Now, let us see why the physical presence of the teacher is important in the classroom. The physical presence of the teacher is important because the teacher has a great role to play. Whether all the teachers play that or not is a debatable issue. But ideally speaking, uh, the teacher, the physical presence of the teacher makes a big difference. When there is someone in flesh and blood 
in front of you, interacting with you, it can make a lot of difference. The teacher basically is the facilitator of learning and learning development in the classroom. And how does the teacher facilitate that? The teacher facilitates that by becoming a co-participant of knowledge, uh, because he is a co-participant in the creation of knowledge. As Vyotsky puts it, you know, knowledge is created, it is constructed. So that is what he says in his theory of social constructivism. We'll come back to that later. So the teacher plays a role in co-constructing the knowledge together with the students. He can negotiate meaning and he can support students in uh, negotiating meaning. He also plays or he also takes care of the affective factors very much required in the classroom. Because we, as we all know, uh, we have heterogeneous, uh, I mean, classroom set up in the sense we have students with multiple intelligences. Students do not have the same, uh, let us say, pace of learning or they do not have the same ability to learn. Uh, some are quick learners, some are slow learners. Some students need to be motivated. They need a lot of not motivation before they can be initiated into any kind of activity. And some students are already motivated and we need to, as teachers, we need to maintain their motivation. So these are certain affective factors. Some students need to be uh, encouraged. Some students need to be appreciated. Some students need to be rebuked. We call it the stick and carrot method. So these affective factors are actually taken care of by the teacher. So he motivates the students. And it is again for the teacher uh, to give feedback on what the students perform. And it is again for the, for the teacher to evaluate, uh, you know, the performance or the linguistic, uh, what you can call acquisition, the level of the linguistic competence of the students in the classroom. All these things are taken care of by the teacher. And that is why we say the physical presence of the teacher in the classroom is of paramount importance. And that is something that we will be missing when we go online. And that is a challenge that we need to address. And the second part of this premise is that, uh, or is, uh, is basically about the presence of the student community in the class. And why is the presence of the student community in the class so inevitable? Because as I mentioned before, knowledge is constructed, rather knowledge is uh, co-constructed. And how does that happen? It happens through face-to-face -face interaction because students involve themselves in debate. No, there will be arguments and let us say it happens through argumentation. It happens through negotiation. All these things play, critical pedagogy basically, all these things play, of course, a big role in, in the construction of knowledge, rather in the co-construction of knowledge. And that is why we say, uh, knowledge is actually a cumulative product, if we can put it that way. So you derive meaning, you come to consensus, you come to negotiation, you build on, you create. And the same thing also uh, is applicable uh, when it comes to the acquisition of skills, not only about knowledge. How do we develop a skill? Can you develop a skill in isolation? I think linguistic skills are developed not in isolation, but they are developed, let us say, in tandem. You need other people to cooperate with you. When I speak, I need someone to listen to me. And if someone is listening, it implies that somebody is speaking to them. When someone writes, of course, the writer expects a reader. Let us, I mean, basically speaking, it is through interaction. It is in tandem that we uh, acquire uh, language skills. And for that reason, the physical presence of the student community is also important. And now when we go online, when the mode of delivery of lessons uh, become online, this is again something uh, that we will be missing and we need to uh, address that. Uh, when I was talking about this, one of my friends raised the question, what about Buddha? Uh, Buddha was totally independent learning in the sense 
uh, we know his was renunciation and the later enlightenment sitting under the Bodhi tree. But then the answer is again, uh, of course, there was renunciation and there was enlightenment, but basically he had to interact with the society. If he had not interacted, if he had not seen the miseries and the sorrows of the people in the world outside his palace, that was, uh, I would say, a kind of interaction with the society, which actually led him to uh, the renunciation and, and later uh, the enlightenment. So basically, interaction in whatever form it is, is important uh, if language is to be acquired and if uh, knowledge is to be uh, constructed. Now let us have a brief look at, uh, I will not be elaborating on this part, briefly what research says about uh, online uh, learning. A study done by Munir and Livy in 2020, that is this year, says that students uh, doing uh, their courses online experience a sense of isolation and disassociation with the institution. And this is a challenge. They complain that they feel isolated. They feel disassociated with the institution. There are so many things. I think Dr. Ajay Gumar was talking about uh, the experiences that you get from the campus. I also saw someone typing the question, what will happen to student politics? What will happen to student unions? So, you know, these are all kind of uh, experiences that we get from the campus. And these are things that we will be missing. Let us uh, just think about, you know, when things become online, when, when classes go online, we have a lot of nostalgias about our campuses. And we have a lot of idols created in our minds. When we speak about teachers, we speak about the so-called <laughs> Ammini teacher. I think only uh, uh, Keralites can understand the real nuance or the connotation of that expression. So what will happen to our much idolized, much celebrated uh, concept of Ammini teacher? And I heard uh, Sri Hari uh, once talking about, uh, let us say, Muralium. And I still remember the whimper of uh, Professor John C. At least some of you uh, know him. I still remember when some of the plants in front of his department were uprooted. There was a big scene created on the campus and I had witnessed that. I still remember his whimper. What he said was something like this in Malayalam. You have uprooted not my plants, but you have uprooted the dreams of my children buried underneath, beneath those plants. So these are all kind of experiences that you get on the campus. Campus, uh, to put in euphemistic terms, is also uh, perhaps a matrimonial catchment area. I still remember Professor Muhammad Sali, uh, to put it in uh, lighter way, I remember him talking about the so-called Panjara Mooks. So you have a lot of experiences that you gain from the campus. You have the student politics, you have the student unions, which actually give you some kind of experience uh, in uh, taking part in democratic practices, in practicing democracy. Uh, I think post I mean, uh, even in the post-corona scenario, democracy will exist, I, I hope. So when you go online, these are all kinds of experience that we will be missing. And that is why we say, when we speak about education, we say education is what you forget or what you remember sorry education is what you remember after you have forgotten all that you remembered so it is what you remember after you have forgotten all that you remembered for the exam so after you forget all that you remembered or memorized for the exam what still remains with you is the real kind of education and that is perhaps very often uh, not inside the classrooms I think uh, some of you will agree with me, very often it is outside the uh, classroom. So these are, you know, the, the experience of the campus. We are going to miss it. And this is something that has to be bridged when we go uh, for online uh, classroom teaching. 
And another challenge that we face now was right was mentioned before. It is again the the uh, what you call the digital divide, which already exists in the world. And with this kind of you know with this online mode of delivery of classes, it is going to affect. It is going to adversely affect rather. Uh, you know the the digitally the technologically marginalized section of the society the kind of division it can be class division it can be societal divisions based on caste creed you know the location urban rural we have so many economic differences all those differences exist uh, in, in in our society which is it, it is a truth it's, it's a reality and this will also have you know its replications it, its reflections you know when we go on digital mode how many uh, people will have access to the internet how many uh, people will be uh, able to afford laptops and expensive mobile phones there is always a difference between a student who uses a very what you call uh, a very ordinary mobile phone with the basic uh, features and a student uh, who can afford to have a laptop with you know uh, the modern devices and all, all those things so that will certainly lead to what you call the re-cementing of or the strengthening of what you call the digital divide that already exists in the world so we need to keep that also on mind uh, when we go for uh, what you call uh, online uh, classes another issue which perhaps encapsulates one of the most uh, or one of the worst fears of online courses is academic integrity i think dr jennifer abatayo will be uh, elaborating on that uh, that issue so how do you make sure that when you get you know a question answered online by the student uh, how do you make sure that it was answered by the student if there is an audio presentation if if the assessment is a presentation an oral presentation how do you make sure that it was uh, uh, presented by your student of course if you are really familiar with the voice of your student you can identify the student but in a classroom with something like 200 300 students sometimes it happens it becomes almost uh, humanly impossible to identify the student by her or his voice so that is another issue so you have also issues related to the academic integrity or plagiarism related uh, matters do we have cultural issues i don't know whether it is there in india but in many cultures of course it is here in oman we have certain issues related to culture uh, because some students especially female students are not willing uh, to be video recorded they do not want to show their face on video recordings it is maybe a cultural not maybe it is a cultural issue and as teachers when we upload videos for the students to watch or to listen to we have to be very careful about the expressions uh, used in that video and we also have to be very careful about the dress code of the speakers or those who are presenting that video session because uh, it can lead to cultural uh, issues again uh, pragmatics of the speakers will always vary depending on the cultures they come from for example uh, if you are listening to a british speaker and if the british speaker says quite good what do we think what 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 do we understand non-native speakers of english when a British speaker says quite good, uh, most of us understand that, yes, he meant it is good. It is quite good. But actually what a British speaker means is a bit disappointing. It is not a positive uh, comment. It is rather a negative comment. And when he says again, that's not bad. When a native speaker or a British speaker says that's not bad, most non-native speakers take it as oh he is congratulating me he is appreciating me uh, for my work but that's not what he does or she does uh, the speaker means to say that's actually poor the performance is not satisfactory it's not up to the mark it's quite poor that's what he means and again if the native speaker especially british speakers when they say i almost agree 
we think oh he has you know uh, come in terms with what i said he agrees with what i say but what he means is i don't agree at all so the there was there can be i mean the list of examples can go on and go on i have just given you a few examples to show uh, to mention the cultural the pragmatic related affairs i mean issues when you go online and when you are listening to speakers of uh, different varieties of english and finally and perhaps most importantly to me is the question what will happen to me as a teacher when everything goes online is it going to affect the teaching profession quantitatively and also qualitatively uh, thank you dr ajay kumar for your uh, reassuring and consoling words because you said the chalk and talk method will continue you have given us uh, hope by saying that because we believe that we will continue to remain on stage or else if everything goes online maybe we have to change qualitatively because the number of teachers already there is a talk in the air about staff cut let it not happen but that is also one issue in question so maybe teachers will have to diversify in their profession they will have to find out you know different modes and different pastures that is also but that is also an issue that remains so i have just highlighted three four uh, issues related to or the challenges related to the present scenario of online teaching now how can we bridge these gaps or how can we uh, address these issues dr christian will be talking about that when he explains how we do uh, our online mode of delivery of classes here keeping in mind all these issues so we need to keep in mind that we need to make the students feel at home we need to reassure them uh, that we are with them so we need to support them how can we do it uh, christine will be elaborating on that we need to keep in mind that there are two parts of this one is quality assurance at the same time let's not forget that this is a kind of crisis management so we are in a crisis we need to manage the crisis but not at the cost of uh, quality quality has to be assured maintained so we need to develop a framework that will match with uh, the mode of teaching that we are doing now that's also important so we need to the question here is now are we going for native online classes or are we going to replicate the traditional teacher student community are we going to replicate you know that mode of uh, teaching i think this is what we should be doing because it's a period of transition we cannot completely do away with that and therefore in a way we need to come out with a framework of delivery of classes which will replicate uh, what you call the kind of teaching that we have been doing uh, before the present scenario so we need to have platforms for discussion to develop critical pedagogy to to encourage debates and interaction with the students we need to motivate and support the students and we can do that in different ways emojis and these and that christine will be talking about that so in addition to all these challenges i think uh, online mode of teaching also has a lot of advantages the most notable advantage that we have seen is that it takes away it 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 removes uh, what you call the inhibition of students to interact with other people because when you are opening your mouth or when you are coming out with your ideas there are so many things involved maybe you have inhibitions regarding uh, how worthy my idea is also you have inhibitions because you are worried about the language that you are using to express your ideas all these things can inhibit the speaker in different ways but when we go online this is what we have noticed even those students who were shy to interact in the classroom in the presence of the teacher uh, and the community of students have come out with their own ideas because they can they don't have to reply to a question then and there they don't have to interact with you when you want they can answer your question at their leisure 
they can uh, check the words that they are using they can check the grammar that they are using so it, it actually gives them some kind of confidence which enables them uh, you know to express their ideas so we guarantee or it facilitates in a way the involvement of students uh, who suffer from what you call this kind of psychological this kind of inhibition so this is one advantage another advantage is you can choose the physical environment you can you you can study at your leisure you can sit in the place that you want to sit you want to sit under a tree and read the material you can do that so it also has a lot of uh, advantages like that and dr christine will be uh, talking about that in the next session and again another notable advantage that we notice is that it has forced us to collaborate like what we are doing now so we are collaborating with uh, other higher educational institutions other HEIs not only within the country it has also encouraged international uh, cooperation so let us break the chain but let us not break this chain of collaboration thank you thank you very much thank you dr raw for an insightful about the spirit of transition from a traditional classroom to an online classroom and uh, we will take up the question at the end of the uh, all three sessions okay thank you very much for the invite i'm so happy that i'm going to share our experiences here in the university so the classroom and now we are having this online classroom or we're having this online learning so here in the suhar in suhar university i'll just give you a little bit of background in suhar university most of our students are women so 90 plus percent of our students are women and we only have few boys so just like what dr roy said we have to consider the culture so it's a very challenging for us to do online learning because most of our staff here in our faculty also are men for me it's okay i'm a woman so i can just uh, see my students i can communicate with them all the time but for men, they have to be a little bit careful. So these are the things that we have to consider. Here in our university, we have what we call Moodle. We call it SULMS. It's Suhar University uh, Moodle. So here, even before COVID, we are already using Moodle. So we have this online uh, management with students. They have to download the files that they need. They have to download our lectures or our material. So in a way, they know how it works. But when we got the COVID, this is challenging for everyone because we have to learn all the features that it has. So now we are learning at the same time and we are teaching our students as well. So, and also, uh, here in our university, in one lecture, we can have as many as 200 students. So imagine the challenge that we face. How can we have a meeting like this if you have 200 students? We even have, you know, problems managing these students when we have the physical classroom. So if it is an online, I don't think it will be doable to have all these 200 students in, in a class. And we also have to consider that these students aside from the culture, that some of them may not have the internet or they might have internet problems. So what is our university doing now? Because of these challenges, we come up with directed remote learning, which is what we call DRL. In, in online learning, we have the asynchronous and the synchronous. So we chose asynchronous. 
uh, because of these issues, the culture, the internet, and then, of course, uh, the number of students. So here we have a system. So the DRL is directed. It is remote. So we have to guide the students on what are the things that they have to do. So in this DRL, we have to put materials in our Moodle or in our system, and we start with the key material. The key material has to be prepared by the teacher. It has to be simple, it has to be direct, it has to be focused. So in a key material, we can have a PowerPoint, but it has, it has to be entertaining to the students in a way interactive, even though they are in a PowerPoint or a Word document. So it has to be uh, guiding the students. The second one, we have, of course, the recommended reading. The recommended reading, not all courses would have this, but even in the recommended reading, we don't just dump uh, chapters of books, no. So we choose the best material that we have. Like for example, in one course, or if you are a, a course coordinator, you can only have four, five, six pages for the students. So these materials, they have to be with high quality. And then we have the supplementary materials as well. So here, this can be videos that the students can watch, or you know, we can have online websites as well here. So that, this is just to help the students understand more about the lesson or about the topic. And then we have also what we call the practice material. Now, in the practice material, we as faculty here, the staff, we have to be very, very careful because we have to make sure that the students would be engaged with this material because this is the time where they have to do their activities prior to their assessment. So here it cannot be too long as well. So students should be able to do their, their practice exercise for a day or two maximum. Because after that, at the end of our our task, we have what we call the assessment. The assessment, it will last for two days with uh, 45 minutes only. So each assessment has to be uh, within 45 minutes. So as teachers, we have to design that our assessment will be like around 30 to 45 minutes. But before all of these things, we have what we call the course profile. It's like a syllabus. So here in the course profile, we have what we call uh, the task. In, in this semester, we only have four tasks. So the four tasks will be covering all the things that you should be covering and they have to be focused. So in short, we will cover only four topics, the most important ones. So, and each task, the students would have an assessment. And the assessment can be formative assessment or summative assessment. So in our faculty, most of us will have two formative assessments and two summative. So 50-50, 50% 50, 50, 50 for the summative first summative assessment and then another 50 for the, the second summative assessment. Now, with all of these things, we have to make sure as teachers that students are engaged. So they have the materials have to be direct, they have to have a focus, and then once they, they study those materials, they do their assessment for 45 minutes. Very simple. So we have this, what we call the task description. We give this to the student. There in the task description, they have to know what to do. So we guide them. Like for example, we say, read this material. It's, it's very uh, a guided material. And then second, we will say, 
watch this video. So students, they will know what to do. What is the first step, the second step, the third step, and the last thing that they have to do. So for two weeks, they will only have one task. In the last two days, they know this already, that the last two days will be their assessment. Now, with Moodle, what else do we have here? We are also using other tools. We have um, the WhatsApp, which is very popular to the students. So anytime they can communicate with their teacher because we want to be with the students, even though we're not physically present, but we have to make them feel that we are here, we are supporting them. And then we also use emails. We also have other platforms. Uh, other teachers, they do Microsoft Teams once every two weeks, or even uh, what do you call Big Blue Button once every two weeks or once every week. So just to make sure that students are engaged and to make sure that students understand their, their lesson, their topic, so they can just have question and answers. Aside from that, we also have what we call a discussion forum. The discussion forums, the, the teachers can pose questions there and students will just you know, answer them or the students can pose questions and then the teacher will answer the students. So here we have interactive uh, thing because uh, some students, they feel like they are alone. So we just have to make sure like, no, you're not alone. We are here uh, with you, we are helping you, we are trying to make you learn things because the students that we have here, most of them are women. So uh, they feel like this is the only, like going to the university uh, culturally, this is their way of socializing. At home, well, they, they don't have a lot of socialization there. So with this one, with all of these methods here, I believe that students are more engaged and we are happy that we are now in task three, almost done, because we only have four tasks and we receive good feedback from the students and they feel that they are very, uh, they are supported by their teachers. And of course, the teachers, we really work hard for this. Even uh, some of the teachers said like, you know, they could not have proper sleep because students would keep on messaging them, asking for help. So, but we have to do what we have to do as teachers. We just have to help them and make sure that they are learning. So basically, these are the things that we are having here. These are the things that we want to share to the world as well, since uh, I, we believe that we are, in a way, doing something good. We're having a good practice in our university. So thank you very much. And I hope you learned something and probably you get something from our end. And uh, I'm so happy again for the invite of this uh, talk. All right, okay, it's, uh, no worries. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Roy and of course from your side for inviting me to speak briefly on online assessment. Uh, this is timely and this is very important these days, especially that um, because of COVID-19 and there are a lot of challenges and hopefully right after my talk, I can share valuable experiences and feedback mechanisms on how to develop effective assessment techniques. Um, please accept my greetings. I am in Manila, Philippines. It's already three o'clock in the afternoon and I hope our brothers and sisters who are with us now are safe. All right, so I'm going to speak briefly. I actually prepared a, a nine-page PowerPoint presentation and I'd like to highlight the authenticity and accountability because this is very important. Um, considering the situation this day, we have COVID-19 and the, the advantage of talking about online assessment is that during the traditional classroom, 
going back to the the uh, the normal situation when there was no COVID at all. I'm not saying this is not generalization, but for sure, online assessment sometimes is being neglected by some other institutions. But now that we have COVID-19, I realize that online assessment comes into its um, great form and its own space. All right, the title of my presentation I put here, what is our accountability and what is authenticity in online assessment? Because that's also very important. I'll go directly now to the demands of online teaching and learning. Dr. Shantos, I hope that the PowerPoint is there. All right. So these are the demands of online teaching and learning. Are we on the same page now? Yeah, sure. The demands of online teaching and learning. There. Can you click, please, the second page? Next, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Where you can see the colored boxes. Yeah, just go to the next slide where you can see their colored boxes and then the title demands of online teaching and learning. All right, okay. So I'm going to talk about briefly again of what demands of online teaching and learning that we are in this uh, in this current situation. I I'm mean, going to play here five. This is based on literature reviews and papers and other reviews around the world. What are the most important demands that teachers should need to know about online teaching and learning? The first one is accountability. Then we have learning outcomes, authenticity, students' performance. And the last one is virtual classroom adaptability. Okay, first, when we speak about accountability, um, it's a nice for teacher and really into technology technology used in the classroom. Um, good cannot be replaced with good technologies. But technologies can be replaced with good teachers. But considering uh, the, the present situation, I think there is always accountability in our part as teachers because it's our role, it's our responsibility in how we can help our students achieve the learning outcomes set for them. I'll, I'll, I'll shift next to the learning outcomes. Why I included here learning outcomes? But there is a, now, there is a sign from a traditional classroom to a virtual classroom. So meaning to say, our learning outcome should be careful and correctly in order to fit into the context of our students' needs. Learning outcomes are very important. And we need to be careful because, again, there is accountability in terms of writing our learning outcomes. Authenticity, this is just a blanket term that be interpreted across many things. But speaking about flipping the traditional classroom into a virtual classroom in that people's distant learners, authenticity of our materials, authenticity of our assessment is a very important I'm sorry. Is it is that very clear? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Yeah, probably because I am in the Philippines and it's kind of far here. I hope um, you you hear me very well. And I'd like to suggest Dr. Santos right after my talk, if we can share the slides to our participants, they can read. And if they have questions, then you can also 
um, write email to me, all right? Okay, so I'll continue with the student's performance. Going back to what I said earlier, that there is accountability on the part of the teacher. We need to write our learning outcomes correctly and clearly because we need to make sure that that fits into the context of our students' needs. Then, the authenticity of our materials, teaching materials, plus the um, type of assessment that we are going to integrate into the online virtual classroom is also very important in order for us to really understand and determine the actual performances of our students. All right, okay, I talk about virtual classroom adaptability, right? So this is a very good question. This is a very good question that I think all of us should consider because even myself, I use, I, I consider myself as an example. I said, am I ready for the virtual classroom? Mm -hmm. Do teachers receive training? Because we are used to the traditional type of classroom, but I, I know and I understand there are a lot of teachers worldwide who are adaptable to this virtual classroom environment. And again, here comes accountability because that's very important. How about on the student's part? Are they ready for a virtual classroom at, um, kind of session? Are students, um, do they have access to internet? These are very important questions that I think we need to understand and consider in terms of implementing online assessment and other activities for teaching and learning. I, I'd like to go back again briefly about what Dr. Roy mentioned earlier on the issue of academic integrity. And she's, he said that it, it's very challenging, it's very difficult on our part because nobody knows as to whether who wrote and who submitted the assignment or the, the, the output of the student. So again, there are many challenges, but it's good that we discuss it now and we go back to our own virtual classrooms and we need to think on how we can help support students' learning. Okay. I have here an extract of a paper that I have uh, published last month. It's about enhancing assessment literacy with the implication of technology-enhanced online assessment. I have here eight, so I'll go briefly to the tips and suggestions for a technology-enhanced instruction. The first one here is if we use online assessment, we need to make sure that assessments are designed with consistency and uniformity. It should be consistent and it should be uniform. Because remember, we are dealing with distant learners and we are in a virtual classroom. So there is no possibility of having a different assessment design, which is not really consistent, which is not uniform. Again, going back to the writing of the learning outcomes, it's, it's very important that it's uniform across or throughout the course or courses. The second one here is Dr. Kristen earlier, if you, if you recall, she talked about dynamic interaction because it's also very important that it's not just uploading learning and teaching materials in a virtual classroom, asking students to submit something without having interaction with them. So make sure that our inter interaction with our students is dynamic. There is dynamism and it should be, there is enthusiasm. Assessments, therefore, must support intensive and self-motivated evaluative measures of students' achievement. The third one here is, I suggest that we adapt an alternative to and in assessments. Why am I saying alternative to assessment? Because, again, it's good that we see our students in classroom. There is a physical kind of talk and we look at our students with their eyes. You see the motivation, the motivation is there. Your presence as a teacher is there. The students can talk to you very easily. But in terms of this virtual classroom instruction, alternative assessments are highly suggested. So there are several types of alternative to and alternative in assessments. But again, if we focus uh, more on the emphasis of the, the importance of the design of the alternative assessments, learning outcomes should be clearly written to reflect skills and abilities to perform. Okay, from the, on the, on the context of authenticity, authenticity, we need to come up with an integrate, an integrate authentic assessment task in all courses. It's not only about language, it's not only about linguistics, it's not only about English language teaching. 
Authentic assessments can be used online across many disciplines like engineering, sciences, um, nursing, and other things. Okay, but to me, personally, when we say authentic assessment, the question is, what, what, when can you say that the online assessment is really authentic? The word authentic is a blanket term, and it can be interpreted by many scholars around the world. And all the participants know that you are listening to me. We have our very own interpretation. What is really an authentic assessment? And what makes our assessment authentic? So I'd like to, to list and to base the criteria of what is an authentic assessment from Gilmore. Gilmore mentioned that an assessment or even a test can be considered authentic if it is situated into these three important aspects. The first one here is the text itself or the assessment itself. Next is the participants, the participants themselves, the students, their social, their social or cultural situation. And what is the purpose of doing the online assessment? It's not just like we, f we face our computer, we write our assessment, we design our assessment just because we, we have an online assessment. We need to consider also the, the, authentic, the, the authenticity measures of our online assessment. Try to understand very carefully whether the material itself or the assessment itself relates our learning outcome to the social or cultural situation of our students the purpose. So this, this is very important by including all these criteria into our learning and even the design of our assessment to say that somehow our assessment is authentic. It's very integration of the itself. We are doing our assessments as participants of the class of situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to me, it looks like from experience, uh, talking from experience, of course, all these things are uh, challenges that we will have to confront if we are to proceed with, you know, the same mode of uh, delivery of classes. But we are not sure that we are going to have the same kind of online delivery of classes, uh, even in the post-COVID scenario. Hopefully, we will come back to, uh, you know, the teacher-student direct interaction mode of delivery of classes as uh, pointed out by uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar in his opening uh, speech. So in that case, the current scenario will not exist. Uh, but assuming that this will continue to remain, the present scenario may not end so fast. And assuming that, uh, you know, the situation will be something like this or online uh, mode of delivery of classes will uh, continue. It will continue to remain there. I would say the most uh, formidable challenge will be what I said there, how to guarantee the integrity of your assessments. That is one thing. You know, people who are desirous of learning will learn. That is what history has shown. If you are really desirous of learning, you will learn. That is a different thing. So, but then I also feel the, you know, the, the inflated value, the undue value that we now ascribe to Marx might disappear. That is one possibility. You know, that is not a challenge, but keeping this challenge in mind, this is, I, I think, it will be a concomitant of this problem. As a result of this, because uh, people will question the integrity of uh, you know, the assessments uh, that if, if you, do, you cannot come out with a real solution for that, that will remain as a challenge. And as a result of that challenge, I feel that uh, the importance of marks will disappear. At the end, it becomes your responsibility to learn that, of course, uh, as a true independent learner, it's always your responsibility to learn. That is why we say teachers are only facilitators and instead of assessing your worth depending on uh, what you call the marks your uh, prospective employers will look at your real competency you will have to prove in the market that you are worthy you will have to prove if i can use the word market you will have to prove to whoever is interviewing you or to your employer 
that you are competent enough and you are capable of you know achieving the task or doing the job so i think the most uh, to conclude yes to answer the question i think this is going to be you know one of the biggest challenges uh, that will remain uh, integrity with regard to assessments i hope i have answered This is a switch over to online. Yes, uh, here the question is how you people tackle the mental trauma facing my student wants switch over to online space. Okay, so the students, uh, how did we tackle this one? We, just like what I've mentioned, we made sure that the students would feel that we are, we, the teachers, are there for them. We supported them in various ways, just like um, what I also discussed. Aside from the Moodle, the system that we have, where it has a lot of functions, we also made sure that we can contact the students through email, through WhatsApp, or other means, just to for them to feel that we are guiding them and we are trying to make them learn and then that we are we are supporting whatever they are going through right now so by just making contact with students i think that would help a lot of things and also dr roy would like to add yeah Dr. Sandosh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to add because I think it has got some relevance to uh, what I was mentioning in my talk before. Uh, I was talking about what you call the, the teacher-student rapport, the kind of rapport that exists between uh, students and teachers. I would, I mean, rapport is more related to perhaps what happens inside the classroom I would like to use the word affinity, if that's okay. You know, there are certain, you know, instances where the, the teacher and the student establishes a kind of bond, you know, between them, a kind of affinity. We, we in the beard classes, we used to say teachers are surrogate parents, uh, you know, and sometimes it happens even in the university. Maybe you are an adult student, you are an adult learner uh, who is supposed to be independent in many ways. But there are occasions when you are mentally broke down or you are physically broke down because of many reasons. And there are occasions when teachers come to your help, just like Dr. Christine was talking about it. So teacher supports you not only emotionally, uh, you know, emotional support is there, but they can also support you in different ways. And that is why I, I was reminded of uh, the, if you remember, I used the expression modelium. Uh, it was coined by Srihari some time ago. I think two, three years ago, I happened to read that. It was a Facebook posting done by Srihari. And he was talking about, uh, you know, uh, how uh, Murali Master supported one particular student who was not able to join uh, a tour or a picnic or something like that. That is a kind of support, you know. These are occasions when the students uh, feel isolated. These are occasions when students feel that they are not supported, maybe emotionally, maybe physically. I also remember many other teachers in the background of keeping Pioneer College in the backdrop, you know. Uh, we cannot forget, like uh, Karimundur Balagashtan Master, we cannot forget Sri Jagannath Pai, the way he used to support students. And and you, I, I think all of us know uh, Dr. P. Bhaskar and Nair, 
who is moving around supporting people in that region so how he has come down to it we i would like to call him a gandhian elt practitioner because he is always in the villages so he is trying to you know educate uh, house uh, housewives he is trying to open venues for you know the, the people in the village so this kind of support uh, can only be given by uh, teachers i mean only uh, can be given only if the teacher is physically present there so that is how uh, perhaps to add to what dr christine was adding i mean talking about this is how people or teachers can emotionally even economically physically uh, support their students dr santosh Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for this question, I will answer it. Yes, uh, we need to have a new syllabus for this. Uh, in our university, we made another syllabus. We call it course profile. And we, in this course profile, we have the learning outcomes. And then we have the four tasks. So because we are now having this online, we chose the best topics that we have in our offline syllabus. So just four, straightforward, very direct. And then even the assessments, they have to change as well. That's why we have a new syllabus. Yes, it is needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I think that's a real issue. You know, you always, you will always have uh, such tricky, mischievous, naughty students, whether it is online or offline, this problem exists. Uh, can you guarantee, I don't know if I am asking a question back to you, Sandosh, I don't know uh, what percentage of attendance you had when you were a student there. Uh, so th this question of <laughs> attendance will always remain. Uh, but then in the Moodle program, yes. in the Moodle program, we have an option. We can see when they joined and whether the students had internet access there. There are certain activities, uh, there are certain activities, certain options are there in the Moodle program that we are using, which will give you a real picture. For example, you, you start an assessment now. So how many students logged in? and how many students could not log in. It will show the duration, it will show the time, and it will also give you uh, an online feedback on why they could not, whether their device was not connected to the internet, those options are there. And as, he, as Dr. Christine mentioned, we have personalized this model program in a way. We call it S-U-L-M-S. That is Sohar University Learning Management System. Yeah. So there you get some kind of feedback. But we cannot guarantee for 100 percent that, you know, there was no kind of uh, uh, what you call mischief involved. But to some extent, of course, we can get a feedback on uh, the, the time they took and whether it was a genuine reason or not. But, you know, loopholes are always there. Hello, uh, Mr. Santosh. I think it is almost time. It is 12.35, I think. So, some 10 more minutes we can remain here, I think. Okay. Yes. Yes, Dr. Santosh, that's a very big question here. How do we address, you know, multiple intelligence? How do we uh, address the issue of differently able? Mm. Uh, I would suggest, I would suggest, I think I do not have a perfect answer for that. It is for all of us academics to have a discussion on that and then evolve it. Yes. We need to come out with uh, a practical solution for addressing that issue. But I would say, uh, we can, if possible, we should also think about organizing uh, what you call some group activities. Maybe we can have smaller groups, depending on uh, if you have less number of students in your class, and if it can be done live, some five students coming together with a leader for the group, and the teacher has, you know, uh, the teacher can also join in, and then we can see how the classroom works. 
that is that that is possible perhaps only when the class goes live where students can also involve so maybe that is one solution uh, to address the differently able people and to address the issue of multiple intelligence i'm not sure whether what i have proposed is a perfect solution i'm sure it is not we need to we need to evolve i do not have a ready made answer for that it is something that need to be i mean need to evolve yeah, that's we, that's it we haven't looked into it Dr. but uh, uh, yes uh, because in our system here we can give assignments we can give quizzes to the students and for this the things that we can do is to give different uh, tasks or practices to the students depending on their intelligences uh, if this will go on so we will really probably doing something like that because at this moment we are just giving one task to the student one assessment one assignment or one quiz so again uh, we don't know when this will end and if ever then we really have to look into how we are to handle different intelligences no. yes yes can i add something yeah going back to the issue or the challenges of this um different types of learners in a virtual classroom in my slides, if, if, if we have time, um, can we share the slides? I mentioned there about accountability because that is the purpose of why we need to understand the different types of learners in a virtual classroom. Because in general sense, the students are considered as distant learners. So there are a lot of issues that, that is involved in terms of that are involved in terms of accountability because that is our responsibility. In an online assessment, virtual learning environment. The alternatives to assessments are highly encouraged. The performance types of assessments are highly encouraged because these types of assessments, online assessments, can generate multiple, multiple responses and output from our students. It's not only one flat sheet that, hey, you need to submit this paper to your teachers. But if we, if we can de develop, if we can design a performance type of an assessment, which is consistent with our learning outcome, then definitely it can generate and help our students to come up with multiple responses that would um, definitely fit the traditional types of a classroom. We are distant learners in a virtual learning environment. Who is it directed to, Dr. Sandosh? Yeah. Uh, it's not completely possible, I would say. That is one of the challenges. That is one of the demerits of what you call uh, offering classes online. Uh, giving what was that individual attention yes uh, because it is if it is food cooked in the same kitchen uh, but served on different plates you know so but what we can do is in the way we support them uh, in the way we interact with the students individually maybe we can take care of some of these issues because like what we have here we have discussion platforms and students can also write to you to your personal uh, or the university email ID and that is uh, a platform where you can have one-to-one -one interaction uh, with, with the student. Maybe that is where you can support them. But remember, uh, nothing can substitute, you know, one thing perfectly. There is no perfect substitute for anything in the world. So offering classes in the real classroom will be always different from offering classes online and some of these issues though can be addressed to certain extent will always remain but this is one way in which you can uh, give individual support to students if you if you know that student if you know that 
that is a student who needs motivation you can you, you can interact with them in such a manner the way you write to them the emojis that you send to them the feed it can be reflected even on the feedback that you give to them in the practice activities etc etc if motivation is what they need and if you think that he is a slow learner maybe you can uh, give them more support you can give them more explanation you can have more personal interactions with them you know these are the things maybe uh, possible things when you are doing an online course that's why exactly yeah blending uh, physical and online coaching blending in the sense can we do it in the in the covid scenario uh, is physical presence of the teacher possible maybe after some kind of relaxation i mean after we have a period a relaxed period maybe not to the full extent maybe we can keep the social distancing can we think of that uh, having only 10 students in our class maintaining that physical distance and then uh, deliver classes uh, maybe these are things we can think of yeah can we have a jennifer okay um, can, can, okay yeah jennifer can you be uh, the uh, can you start yeah yeah that's a very good question but um, personally personally from my very own perspective the online teaching virtual environment is not very new to us because even before the covid scare came into existence we do online teaching we do kind of blended type of learning so that's a very good practice i think the way i look at teaching and learning after covid experience is that um all of us i think we have very important role in in developing teaching and learning that can really cater to the needs of our students our students of this days are considered as again i will use distant learners so there are a lot of parameters in terms of understanding what they need their 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 wants in terms of teaching and learning and of course on the part of teachers i'm not sure if you heard me talk earlier about for us teachers if we ask ourselves are we also ready for this kind of education type of education do we receive good training about online teaching so that's a very good question how about students accessibility adaptability and a lot of things so this is a question that i think all of us have good answers and i hope and i pray that in the future after covid everything will be normal and from our own experience and we can integrate we can help ourselves as teachers and continue supporting our students to advance their learning yeah okay uh, yeah thank you sandosh yeah i think uh, dr ajay kumar had slightly hinted at this uh, i think i totally agree with him because i think in the post covid scenario there is going to be a kind of hybrid kind of education i think he used that hybrid because we are going to have plan b in case of a pandemic situation like this again in the future we need to keep our students uh, equipped and another thing is because because the teachers also need to be trained that was also mentioned before i think uh, using technology uh, in education will become you know yeah, exactly so it will become an important part of the training courses uh, because the teachers also need to be uh, trained and prepared for facing uh, such crises uh, if if at all they happen in the future so i think these are the two things so it will take a hybrid nature with more incorporation of technology and it will also have its implications on training courses i think this will be the effect of the present scenario on the post covid scenario thank you sandosh and uh, now i think uh, we don't have time as well uh, they said um, i agree with them the students they have to be prepared also they have to be tech savvy as well as the teachers because at this moment we are also learning how to navigate uh, you know our system how to do a lot of tricks you know, and how to make sure that with technology we are still engaging our students
I think that's all. So good afternoon, one and all. Now that we have come to the fag end of the second session of the international webinar organized by the Postgraduate Department of English, Pino College, Pino, in collaboration with the Kerala State Higher Education Council and Faculty of Language Studies, Sohai University, Oman. I consider this as my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this very special occasion. So first of all, on behalf of the Postgraduate Department of English, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Roy P. Wittel, Assistant Professor of Applied Linguistics, Sohai University, a man who initiated the discussion on the topic COVID-19 and student engagement in virtual classrooms. He threw light on the challenges that we are going to experience or right now that we are experiencing in the teaching learning process by providing a suitable instances as well. He also stressed on the importance of incorporating technology into the teaching learning process. Thank you for sharing your valuable insights with us, sir. It is indeed a thought provoking session, especially in the spirit of transition, as you mentioned. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Christine D. D. Leon, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Language Studies, Sahai University, Oman, who talked about her experiences of online teaching and also talked about how to deliver the online classes by introducing as the new systems of learning like GRL. And she also explained to us how to make use of the social platforms like WhatsApp, email, etc. for the effective teaching and learning process. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I would like to thank Dr. Jennifer Abatayo, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Language Studies Chair and also Chairman at the Center for Educational Development, Saha University, Oman, who talked about the online assessment and how it has to be done effectively. Thank you, sir. Now, a sincere thanks to Dr. VM Sandosh, Coordinator IQAC and also the Faculty of the Postgraduate Department of English Pioneer College, who delivered the welcome address and also introduced, introduced to us uh, the chief guest of this session. Thank you, sir. Now, I thank Ms. Anju A, the anchor of the session, who with her timely intervention ensured the smooth going of this session. Thank you, Ms. Anju. Now, for the sake of formality, I thank all my colleagues, and I'm sure without whose help and support, this webinar would not have been possible. Thank you, one and all. Now, last but not the least, I extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to all the participants of this seminar, irrespective of the uh, technical interventions that we had in between. They remained with us throughout this session. Thank you for your wonderful cooperation and thank you for making this session a highly interactive one. And um, I'm sorry if I miss out anyone. Once again, I thank each and every one of you. Thank you.